Dr. Silverstein, it's great to see you. We're excited to have you last, but surely not least. Um, and I know you're going to be talking about neurophysiology. I think that a lot of people aren't sure about what that field is. So we'd love to hear more about that. Um, and that is the plan. We're all really, really excited. That is the plan. Good. <laughs> then you are good to go if you want to start a couple minutes early. Um, or we can keep waiting, but we are ready for you. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you to Brain Turns for inviting me to give this lecture this morning. I'm Dr. Justin Silverstein. I'm a surgical neurophysiologist in the Department of Neurology at Lenox Hill Hospital, and I'm going to kind of bring you into the life of a surgical neurophysiologist and what we do. We kind of bridge the gap between scientists, um, some of us are physicians, some of us are uh, doctorate level providers, there's a different range, we come from all different backgrounds, um, but I'm kind of bringing you into our world and kind of how we um, provide a role in the operating room uh, during complex neurosurgical procedures. So what is the surgical neurophysiologist? Well, we're kind of the eyes of the nervous system when the patient's undergoing a complex surgical procedure when the nervous system is at risk. Neurophysiology is how the nervous system functions. So we're able to see how the nervous system functions where the surgeon can see what he's doing. Like Dr. Ellis just gave an, an excellent presentation about you know, taking out that uh, subdermal, uh, subdural hematoma and he can see the brain and he can see the structures, but he doesn't know the function of those structures while he's doing the surgery. And that's where somebody like myself comes into play. So the way we do that is we come into the operating room and we connect the patient to all different electrodes. I'm gonna go through all this uh, in the talk. I know there's a lot of pictures here. I'm gonna go through them. There's a lot of pictures on this screen, um, but basically we're, we're part of the opera, the surgical team, and we're kind of the eyes outside of the surgery, what the surgeon is looking at to tell them how the function of the nervous system is working during a procedure. And the way we do that um, is by connecting the patient to different electrodes. And we basically look at uh, different aspects of the nervous system, depending on what structures are at risk during that said procedure. Um, so here is uh, Dr. Bookfar doing a, a brain surgery. And here I am in the corner, I have a machine. I'll show you what that machine looks like, that where we sit uh, next to the anesthesiology team, and we have a basically a computer setup that we are connected through cables and electrodes to a patient. So this is kind of where we hang out in the, uh, in the back corner. And the idea is that if we see something happening to the nervous system, we can intervene. We can let the surgeon know, hey, there's something going on with the nervous system right now. And we need to take corrective actions because we want this patient waking up neurologically intact. If they came in to the operation neurologically intact, we want them leaving the operation neurologically intact. And that's why we're there. Uh, here's another uh, case that we did. And this, this is actually OR5 at Lenox Hill. And this was OR3, I believe. This is a, a bunch of years ago. Here I am and I'm looking at brain waves during a, during a procedure. Uh, Dr. D'Amico, who was nice enough to invite me to, um, to lecture today, uh, him and I tend to do late Friday night surgeries together. Uh, here I am with him on one of our Friday night spine specials that we uh, did because we're involved, surgical neurophysiologists are involved in spine surgery, brain surgery, peripheral nerve surgeries, anytime the nervous system's at risk. And like I said, I'll go um, through that. The nice thing about being a surgical neurophysiologist is that it, and, and, and really any um, discipline in healthcare, is it affords the opportunity to give back. Um, and I've been, able to go on medical missions here. Uh, we were down in Costa Rica doing a medical mission for um, patients under, uh, children undergoing uh, spine deformity surgery. So these kids had devastating spinal deformities. And we went down there and with a group of spine surgeons and a group of neurophysiologists and a group of anesthesiologists, and we provided care to these patients, I think in this, in this one week, we did 11 uh, surgeries and very complex procedures. And this is, like I said, this is the machine that we use. And part of when you do a medical mission is you, you teach the local providers down there. And it's, it's really fulfilling because they, um, 
they know what, what to do, but they don't have necessarily um, the resources to do some of the more complex procedures that we do um, here in the in the U.S. And in some of the places where we do the medical missions. So here was the local neurophysiologist who came to shadow with me during the course of the week. And uh, since we were both inked up, we decided to show that off a little bit during this, uh, this day. And what was, what was great about this was him and I really hit it off really well but we couldn't speak to one another. I, I, didn't, I don't speak Spanish and he doesn't speak English. So everything we discussed was through Google Translate, which really gets interesting when you try to uh, translate neurophysiology because we do have our own language that we speak, but we got through it and it was a really, really uh, fulfilling and rewarding um, opportunity. Uh, here I am with one of our patients. This is a 14 year old girl that had a, uh, a, a, a very severe spinal deformity. And here we are, this is OR4, I believe, or OR5 in the um, Langs Hill Hospital. And this is myself with one of my colleagues and we're monitoring the nervous system during a surgery. So like I said, we're just a part of that surgical team um, and we have a role to play and we're gonna kind of go through what we do here. Um, so the machine, this is our machine. It's basically a laptop and it's hooked up to uh, a bunch of boxes and these boxes are stimulators and recording devices. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to stimulate the nervous system throughout a procedure and we're gonna record from the nervous system throughout the procedure basically all the bioelectrical activity from a patient, we're going to take that off the, off the patient when they're on the operating room table and it's gonna be converted to a computer screen here. And we're basically looking at waveforms and that's your nervous system essentially in a sine wave is the easiest way to explain it. So as you can see here, this is the operating room table. There's no patient here yet, but you see these cables running along the floor. These are all connected to our machine. This is the way we're able to sit away from the sterile field. You know, we're not, in the surgery itself. We're sitting in the corner, and but we are connected to the patient in real time throughout the procedure. And all of these cables connect back to our computer screen. And uh, like I said, there's different stimulations and recording devices that we're looking at. Um, these are some of the boxes that go on the operating room table that are connected to our machine and all these colorful cables. These are the electrodes that we have uh, placed in, in the patient. These electrodes are in the form of needles. They're little needle electrodes that we place in different muscles or over different nerves. And we can, like I said, we can either stimulate the patient or we can record from the patient. And this is just what it looks like when we do a pre-setup. So there's a lot of stuff going on here that we have to kind of keep track of. Um, and I'm gonna go more into that. So what exactly is surgical neurophysiology? Well, your nervous system is like a highway. You have all these impulses going from your arms and your legs to your brain or from your brain down to your muscles. And this is, it's a pathway. The role of surgical neurophysiology is if there is a traffic jam along that highway, we're able to intervene and say, doctor, there's something happening to this patient's nervous system. We now have a traffic jam along this highway from whether it's stimulating a nerve and recording at the brain. And all of a sudden, the, um, you got a picture of these cars as being impulses. And these are nerve impulses. And the, the street or the highway is the, the nerve itself, the path of the nerve. And it's traveling to the brain or vice versa. If there's a traffic jam, we intervene. We wanna make sure the patient wakes up moving everything at the end of the procedure. The way that you can equate this, so it's very easy, because um, obviously there's a lot of different levels of, of knowledge on this, um, on this talk. When your arm falls asleep, that is a traffic jam to your brain. So that numbness and tingling that occurs in your fingers when you lean on your arm for too long and you fall asleep and your, your arm gets numb, that is a disruption in your nervous system path. That means that the impulse going from, the, from your arm to your brain has a traffic jam and it's reversible, right? It's reversible because when, when, when it happens to you, you move your arm, you shake your arm, the, um, the numbness tingling goes away and your arm is fine. Well, in the operating room, the patient can't move their arm. They're under general anesthesia. They are asleep. So it's my job to move their arm for them. If I see this happening, I will get up there and I will actually move their arm for them, um, depending on uh, you know what's going on with the patient. Not everything is arm related. I'm just making that uh, you know anecdotally so you understand uh, kind of what we're looking at. If if you if when your arm falls asleep, if you were stimulating your nerve and you were recording from your brain, you would actually see a traffic jam on that um, pathway. So that's the easiest way to equate, equate this. 
So it's applied in surgical procedures when the nervous system's at risk. So brain surgery, spine surgery, peripheral nerve surgery, certain vascular procedures, and certain uh, ENT procedures. So we talked about the arm falling asleep. Now, you don't have to be a neurophysiologist to understand this. If you see where I have circled these upward deflected waveforms, this is a healthy arm. This is your arm completely fine. Then it flattens out. You can see it's completely flat. That's your arm becoming numb. This is a numb arm right here. Well, then we adjust the arm. We do it because the patient can't do it for them. And the response comes back. You can see it becomes negatively, it becomes deflected again here. You can see the response. And this patient wakes up neurologically intact. If we didn't intervene in this case, this would stay flat for, let's say, five, six, seven hours, depending on the surgery. These are complex spinal procedures uh, that can, can occur in complex brain procedures. And if you don't move your arm, so for example, if, if your arm falls asleep and you don't get blood flowing back to that arm to get that nerve working again, eventually the motor component of your nerve will die or be damaged and you will have a paralyzed hand. That's what can happen here is if we don't intervene and we let this go for six hours, because you would never let your uh, arm that has fallen asleep be asleep for six hours. You'd, as soon as it starts bothering you, you start moving it around. So we see this electrically. So what we're looking at here is we've stimulated the nerve at the, at the wrist, for example, and this is a recording from their brain. And this is showing that traffic jam. So just really uh, quick understanding of how to look at that. And here, this is actually in a Dr. D'Amico case where this happened, the arm fell asleep on this patient and I went up under that drape and fixed the arm till we got into a position that that patient can tolerate for the remainder of the procedure. So again, he's having a lumbar spine, lower back spine surgery. It would be devastating if he woke up with a paralyzed arm. We would, would not want that to happen. So we do everything that we can to make sure these patients are safe during these procedures. And we're just a, a safety net uh, for, the, uh, for the surgical procedure. So that's my arm moving their arm. So the way we do neuromonitoring or surgical neurophysiology is we do what, what we call a multimodal neuromonitoring approach. And what that means is we do a variety of uh, neurodiagnostic tests throughout a procedure. And these tests uh, are done um, in tandem with one another. So we're constantly multitasking. We don't just do one test. We evaluate the nervous system as wholly as we can, as we're able to. And uh, the way we do that is we have a variety of tests and, and we don't necessarily do every single one of these tests on every single surgery, but we do a variety of these tests on most surgeries. Um, for example, we do somatosensory evoked potentials or SSEPs. And this is where we stimulate a sensory nerve somewhere in the limb, so at the wrist or the ankle. And then we put recording electrodes along the pathway of the nerve that we're evaluating up to the brain. And what we're looking at is we want to evaluate the SSEP in time and size. So how long it takes from stimulating the wrist and it gets to the brain and also how big that response is. Because if it starts slowing down during the course of a surgery, meaning it's taking longer to get from the wrist to the brain, we need to intervene. If it gets smaller during a surgery, we need to intervene. That means something's happening. That means there's a traffic jam occurring in the nervous system. Uh, we also do motor evoke potentials. Motor evoke potentials, we can either do them transcranially, meaning we can stimulate through the cranium, or we can do them direct cortically, where after Dr. Ellis in the last talk, he talked about uh, he spoke about taking off the bone the bone flap. Well, we take off the bone flap, we can actually put an electrode on the brain, stimulate the motor cortex directly, and get responses from muscles. And what we're doing is basically moving the patient for them. We're having them flex and extend muscles throughout a procedure. And again, we're, we're looking at the same thing. We're looking at size and shape of these waveforms on our screen. So if it's a certain size at the beginning of the surgery, that's that patient's baseline. If something should happen throughout the course of the surgery that causes an adverse event to happen to the nervous system and it gets smaller, for example, or the shape changes dramatically, then we intervene. We wanna make sure the patient wakes up moving everything. So SSEPs and motor potentials, these are, these are what we call time-locked um, modalities, meaning we stimulate it and record a very specific point in time that we're looking for. 
The next two modalities are not time locked. Uh, one is called EMG or electromyography. The other one is EEG or electroencephalography. EMG is recording of spontaneous activity from the muscle. We take needle electrodes and we place them in muscles that we're concerned about during a, a surgical procedure. And basically what we want with EMG is a flat line. We want that muscle not to be doing anything during surgery. And if that muscle starts to fire, meaning it starts flexing on its own because the surgeon might be too close to a nerve, then that's what we uh, see as an alert. So we, we're looking for any kind of activity that's not a flat line with regards to EMG. On the other side of things, EEG, and we're not stimulating anything. So it's just spontaneous activity from, from the muscle itself. So if a surgeon bangs on a nerve, we'll see a flurry of activity on our screen. We're not actually stimulating the patient uh, to cause that activity. Now, electroencephalography uh, is an EEG. You can record it from the scalp or directly on the brain like you can with the motors as well. Um, that's known as electrocorticography. And here we're looking at spontaneous activity from the brain. Again, there's no stimulus applied to it. We evaluate the EEG by looking at any kind of activity that's also not a flat line. But un unlike EMG, EMG we want, we want it to be flat. We don't want activity. With EEG, we want activity because that tells us the brain is alive and working. If there's a flat EEG, that means nothing's going on in the brain. That is potentially a problem. Uh, we also do nerve conduction. This is where we stimulate a peripheral nerve and we record from a muscle that that nerve um, innervates or controls. And we evaluate nerve conduction by the intensity of the stimulation that we're using. So how much stimulation do we need to to acquire a response. Also, is there a presence of that waveform? Because sometimes we do nerve conduction. We want to stimulate areas that are not nerves and then find the nerve. And we want there to be a presence or absence of that waveform. So we know sometimes we use it to help identify structures that the surgeon can uh, take out, for example, when he's doing a tumor resection. And then finally, we also do what's called uh, brainstem auditory evoke responses or BEARS. Uh, these are where we put little ear inserts into the ear canal and we stimulate the auditory nerve and we record from the brainstem. And just like the somatosensory evoke uh, potentials, we evaluate uh, bears by time and size. So the amount of time it takes to stimulate and record that path and how big they are. And again, this is just our machine and showing this was a spine surgery we were doing. Um, Dr. D'Amico there, here's the patient. You can see some of these electrodes are fixed. And I have better pictures uh, fixed and they're all connected to our, our little pods here that come back and connect to our screen. And like I said, we do a multimodal. So we're, everything that you're seeing on this waveform, we're looking at multiple tests at the same time. So uh, just to keep in mind, we do multitask a lot. So I'm gonna go through some of these modalities. So an SSCP or the somatosensory evoked potential, it really primarily monitors motor uh, sensory function. It can indirectly monitor motor function and it can help identify the sensory versus motor cortex in uh, brain surgery. So what we do is we have stimulation electrodes, uh, for example, on a peripheral nerve here. And then, so here's the nerve. Here's the spinal cord and here's the brain. And then along this pathway, we place electrodes and all these uh, represent little recording electrodes. And when we stimulate, when the impulse passes under one of our microphones here, we get a response on our screen, a waveform. Um, and that's what's, showing, that's what's showing you down here in this animation. When it passes through and under our uh, electrodes, we get a response or a, a wave on the screen. And again, we're looking for how long it takes to get from here to the brain. And if it slows down, that's cause for alarm. Or if it gets smaller, meaning that there's a block somewhere and you're no longer getting a response, um, it can cause, uh, that can be cause for alarm. Now in brain surgery, we can place an electrode. So these are, uh, these are electrodes placed on the scalp. In, in brain surgery, we can place an electrode directly on the brain. So what you're seeing here with these numbers five and six, this is an electrode that's right on the brain itself. And what we can do is we can stimulate the nerve the same way here uh, at the wrist. And instead of recording from the scalp, we record directly off of this strip electrode. And this strip electrode uh, has 
has contacts numbered one through six, and we can only see five and six here. Um, so basically one, two, three, four, five, and six. So when we record here, what we can do is, we'll show you here, this is a, a quick video. What's happening is I'm stimulating a nerve and I'm getting a response, but what I wanna show you, and I'll see if I can control this. Oops. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, so you can see these these deflections here. This right here is sensory cortex. So one, two, and three are sensory cortex. And then there's a mirror image where it reverses. This is called a phase reversal. Four, five, and six, and see I have a number here. These correlate to the contacts on this triple electrode. So this inversion of the response tells me that four, five, and six are motor cortex. So if the tumor is living underneath the area here of contacts five and six, the surgeon is not going to want to cut into the brain here because if they do, the patient is going to be paralyzed. This is where the motor cortex lives based on our mapping of the brain. So this SSCP is a very useful tool in helping the surgeon. Again, the surgeon can see, but doesn't look like what it looks like in textbooks. We're able to tell him the functionality of what's happening here. And he can make a decision on how he wants to approach the brain um, to safely take out a tumor. Uh, this is just showing, again, you can see these, these deflections here. And then you can see that it shifts in time on both sides and it doesn't look the same. Well, that's the arm falling asleep again. And then we fix it. So, you can see any kind of abnormal, you know, there, you know, I don't want to get too into the into the nitty gritty details of, of how we evaluate and interpret some of the stuff because I'll definitely uh, start losing you, but uh, there are uh, certain percentages that we look for and certain criteria that we look for and so on and so forth uh, before we make a call. It's not just any little deviation, but this is just showing you kind of big deviations that you can see here. There's the response there, it's not good. And here it comes back after our intervention. Motor evo potentials is another modality that we do. Remember, we don't do these statically. We're doing, we're doing, we run SCP, we run a motor. We're constantly looking at the EMG. We're doing this throughout the procedure. Um, now, with motor evo potentials, we stimulate the cranium, and we put needle electrodes in different muscles that we're concerned with, depending on the surgery that we're doing. Um, so here's what it looks like in surgery. There's Dr. Ellis. Uh, we were doing a, a big case together. There's a brainstem case. And we were, um, here's, here's our electrodes that I'm telling you about. These are in the scalp. Where all this tape is are needles in different muscles of this patient's arm. You can't see the rest of the body. We have needles everywhere in all different muscles. Um, and basically when we stimulate the brain, we get a response from where we have needles placed. And there's a lot of tape here because they are needle electrodes. We have to keep them affixed. We don't want them um, you know, coming out and sticking somebody. So this is what happens when we stimulate, goes through the spine, down through the nerve to the muscle, and then we get a response on our screen. It's very quick. If there's an injury, and very rarely is an actual transection of a nerve itself. It's most likely a what we call a conduction block or a, or a damage to the nerve. But what happens is if you have a conduction block, then you won't get a response because there's something happening at the level of the nerve, the level of the spinal cord that's causing the motor not, be, not being able to get to the muscle. Now, what it looks like on our screen, this was a, a brain case that we did with uh, Dr. D'Amico. This is what basically you flex in your bicep. This is what your bicep flex looks like uh, in surgical neurophysiology. That's what it looks like. So. What you see at the front of the screen here, that's just a stim artifact because we have to prime the motor neurons in order to, to, get a, to get a patient to flex their muscle while they're under anesthesia, you actually have to prime the alpha motor neurons. So we, so we elicit um, five to nine pulses before we even send the full stimulus down. So that's just an artifact. So what you see here is the response here these kind of squiggly lines. These are all different muscles. So this is like the shoulder. This is the biceps. This is the forearm. These are the hands. There's a couple of um, foot muscles here. And I'll show you what it looks like when we require. It's very quick. So we'll play the video. There we go. So you'll see we'll trigger it. So we, we stimulate it and it's just that quick. 
you get a response. And it's that quick. If that goes away, we can immediately intervene. We tell the surgeon, oh, something's going on with the, with the motor system, and we need to take corrective actions to reverse whatever's happening. Uh, this is just showing you, um, again, this, this stuff in the front, that's all artifact, but you can see these, the response here and the response here and the response here and here, and then you can see it flatlines here where it stays stable on these muscles. These are all different muscle groups that we're targeting. And in this case, unfortunately, um, it was too late for us to intervene. By the time we noticed the flat lines, um, it was too late. And this patient woke up with a, with a devastating lower extremity injury. They couldn't extend their knee. They have a quadriceps uh, uh, palsy. Um, and this was an unfortunate situation. Um, you know, we, we are very good at, at reversing injuries, but not all injuries can be reversed, unfortunately. Um, and we, we do try our best. It's, uh, it's what we do. But you can just wanted you to just kind of see here. You can see the response, and then you see it flats. It flattens out here, and that's that's not good. That's uh, that's not good in our world. We and we want to be able to reverse it so it comes back. Um, EMG is the spontaneous activity. We just stick uh, needles in different muscles, and we look at this kind of what we call free run activity. We're not stimulating the patient at all. We're just looking at the activity, and if there is activity. We want to be flat. If there's activity, we tell the surgeon, oh, you're too close to that nerve. Um, this is what it looks like. So you see the flat lines, that's good. But then you have some activity from one of the muscles. Each one of these lines correlates to a muscle group that we're looking at in the operating room. So you can see all these muscles are flat, but these muscles are firing. And we would tell the surgeon, oh, the, you know, this, whatever muscle this is, uh, is, is firing. So they might be, you know, working around that nerve. It means they're too close. They're irritating the nerve. Uh, the idea of EMG is to predict impending irritation or injury to a nerve. And you can see these, all these little electrodes, these are all needles that are in different muscles corresponding to the muscles that we want to evaluate during a procedure. So uh, that's what it looks like. These are also the same needles that we use because we're doing multiple tests. They're the same needles that we're using for uh, motor potential acquisition. They share the same needles. We don't put extra needles into the same muscles. We use one, one, one pair of needles in a muscle, evaluates our EMG, looks at our motor potential, uh, potentially can simulate nerves depending on what we're doing. So, uh, we do multi-use everything um, on our computer screen. Everything on a computer screen is then separated out via filter systems and so on and so forth, which I don't want to get into the, too much of the nitty gritty on. Uh, triggered EMG or nerve conduction uh, can help identify uh, the proximity of nerve tissue. Um, typically we equate one milliamp of stimulation to one millimeter of distance. So if we're near a nerve and we're at one milliamp, we're right on that nerve or one or, or very close to that nerve, one millimeter away. If, if we're stimulating and we're not getting a response uh, up to five milliamps, it means we're about five millimeters away from a nerve. So the higher intensity that we need, the further away we are to the nerve. The, clo the lower the intensity, the closer we are. So <clears throat> this is valuable in identifying mal malplaced uh, pedicle screws in spine surgery. So you can see like this screw is placed very nicely where this screw, this is the spinal cord here, and this is the uh, nerve root. This screw is kind of placed where you would think it's in the nerve root. Well, we can electrify the screw with a stimulator. And by electrifying the screw, based on the number that we get, if the, if the um, screw is completely within bone, we get a very high intensity, meaning 20 milliamps, 30 milliamps of intensity to even get a response from the muscle. But if it's on the nerve, and we stimulate this screw, for example, we'll get a response at one, two milliamps. And that's cause for alarm. We tell the surgeon, oh, um, we're at one or two milliamps. Then they'll take an x-ray, they'll evaluate, and they go, oh, yeah, we, we breached this, and they have to fix it and redirect it. That's why we're there. Uh, in peripheral nerve surgeries, here's, here's a tumor. This is a, another Dr. Ellis case. Here's a, a tumor. And what we wanted to see is a lot of times these tumors um, are, are, they come from nerves and they're connected on both sides by a nerve. But a lot of times the nerves are not functioning. But, but Dr. Ellis doesn't want to come in here and just cut this out. That would be very dangerous because if this was the nerve that controlled, let's say, your ability to open and close your hands, 
it would be a devastating injury. So we take electrodes, these are stimulating electrodes and, and we stimulated the nerve. He actually he actually has hooks on it and we've hooked the nerve on one side and hooked the nerve on the other side and we stimulate and record. So this is, this is a stimulator and this is a record and we stimulate through the nerve, uh, through the tumor. And this turned out to be a non-functioning um, uh, nerve. So he was able to cut this out. The nerve that was functioning was actually right under this area. So uh, we had to be very careful not to hurt that nerve. Now, in this video, this is a uh, tumor uh, by the lumbar uh, nerve root of L3. And you injure L3 and it's a devastating injury. You can't extend your knee, uh, quadriceps are involved. You never walk uh, the same again. So here, the surgeon sees the tumor, but we haven't found the nerve yet. And as you can see uh, on our screen here, it's hard to kind of see what's going on there, what's nerve, what's not nerve. So we bring a stimulator in and we stimulate. And what I want you to watch is, I'm gonna play it a couple of times. We're gonna bring a stimulator in, we're gonna find the nerve. Watch my screen. All of a sudden you'll see waveforms pop up. That's the muscles that are connected to this nerve popping up. Um, you hear we get pretty excited uh, if the, if the, if the um, um, audio works on this, you'll hear we get pretty excited uh, when we find the nerve because the surgeon uh, is about to take this tumor off. He has to be very careful. So we do get excited when we find the nerve because we know, okay, we need to stay away from that. So here we go. Hope you guys can hear that. So that's us stimulating it. There's the, the muscles responding. There's the stimulator, we'll play it again. So watch the stimulator comes in. So, so that's the nerve underneath there that you can't even tell. And that's the stimulator. And they were able to do a complete total resection of this tumor without injuring the L3 nerve root, which was huge. And that's why we're, why we're there to help identify. Um, in this case, this was a, a tethered cord surgery and tethered cord surgery, um, the idea is that we want to find healthy nerve. And then there's this piece here called the phylum terminale that we want to, uh, the surgeon wants to cut. Now we have to make sure that it's not, not a functioning nerve. So what we do is we first threshold healthy nerve, which we see down here, this is healthy nerve. We get that to the lowest amount of stimulation needed to uh, elicit the response. And once we get that, then we'll stimulate what we think is the phylum terminale and we'll go up in intensity to make sure that we're not getting a response. If we don't get a response, we know that that's safe to cut. And so this will show you that. So you can see the response on our screen. Stimulator there, stimulating the nerve. And we're just kind of thresholding the stimulation. And here we are stimulating now the phylum terminality and you can see no response on our screen now. And we're increasing. So I'll do that again so you can see it again. So stimulating here, you can see the response here on the screen. That's all response right there. Stimulating that stimulator here, stimulating that nerve. And now we're stimulating here and you don't see any responses happening here. And that's exactly what we wanted. They were able to essentially um, you know, cut the phylum terminality without having any adverse effects with the patient. The next um, uh, modality is brainstem auditory vocal responses. Uh, this evaluates the auditory nerve and evaluates about 20% of the brainstem. The way we, this is different. This is not an electrical stimulation the way motor vocal potentials are and somatosensory vocal potentials are. This is a click and air stimulation. So basically we put little ear inserts, almost like air buds into the, or air pods into the ear and they're connected to this tube. And this is a stimulator. We deliver a click stimulus at about 90 decibels um, into the ear. And then we record from right outside the ear and then also at the top of the scalp. And we're looking at the pathway of the brainstem and it, it ends up in five waveforms, that pathway. And we're looking again for um, very specific five waveforms, what they look like in time and size. So here's what it looks like in, in real life. Um, you can see here's wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, and wave five. 
And that's what we're looking at. And now we're going to look at deviations off of this. So the blue is our baseline. And if things start shifting in time, getting later, then that's cause for concern. That means there's a block of, of a traffic jam in, in the highway. So maybe this will... So the green is, is our baseline. So this is normal. Here's one, uh, we'll call this three and five here. And then you can see in the blue trace, it starts shifting. This is an abnormal shift. It's not the same in time. And this is where we start intervening. We say, okay, there's something happening here. What's going on with the auditory system? Because everything is shifting um, and getting slower. Things can get faster. Faster is okay. Things slowing down in your nervous system is not good. Uh, next is electrocorticography and EEG. This is spontaneous. EEG uh, and electrocorticography on the operating room are used to identify seizures, whether they're primary, whether the patient's there for the seizure, or if they're induced by our cortical stimulation. So when we stimulate the brain directly, there is a very, very small chance that we can elicit a seizure. Uh, so if that happens, we have to be prepared for that, and we take preventive, preventative action when that does happen. Um, EEG can also assess assist in helping us assess how deeply anesthetized the patient is. And that's really for us and our anesthesiology colleagues where um, we can tell them, okay, the patient's adequately anesthetized, the nervous system's still working, but they're not feeling anything. They're not um, awake by any means. So this is one of our surgeries. Uh, this is an EEG, what it looks like on our screen. Um, you know, this is a, um, what you're seeing there so right there, that's us stimulating the brain. And what we're now looking for is any kind of seizure activity to follow, which doesn't happen here, which is good. But that's us actually sending a motor uh, stimulation down and we see it as an artifact in our EEG. Um, this is showing what we call burst suppression. This is a, a burst of activity here. And these are this is suppression. And this just shows that the patient's adequately anesthetized under anesthesia. This is what the electrodes look like when we're doing intraoperative EEG uh, on the scalp. And this is what electrocorticography looks like when we put electrodes down directly on the cortex itself and we record from all of these different electrodes. So a quick uh, case study. This is a case that Dr. Ellis and I did um, a couple months ago. This is a big acoustic neuroma. So what you see here, here's a tumor here. An acoustic neuroma comes it basically comes off of the uh, the acoustic nerve, the, the auditory nerve, and you can kind of see the nerve here. Now, the auditory nerve and the facial nerve live very close together in this world. They're very, very close together. And there is a, especially in this tumor this large, there is a, a, a high risk of a facial nerve injury. And a facial nerve injury is a dev devastating injury, um, an injury where the patient's face is paralyzed. They can't smile. It's, it's just debilitating. It's horrible, horrible. So um, we're there to help identify potential uh, injuries. So in this case, um, and I'm not going to play the video. I'm just going to kind of scroll through it. Here's the big tumor. We don't know where the tumor is. So what we're seeing here is and again, this is the artifact of the simulation. And then what you see all right here, I'm just going to kind of kind of square it out. These are motor potentials from facial muscles in this case. So the blue is a baseline and the purple is subsequent. So what we do is we have our baseline and then throughout the case, we're constantly running that motor and we're recording. So that's what you're seeing here. And you can see these, to, 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 to me, these are very good, well-defined, well well-established, nice and large. And we're happy about that. As we go on with the procedure, and again, remember we're doing multimodal. So we do the motor of a potential. Now we're searching for the nerve with a stimulator. And we're about three and a half hours into resecting this tumor. We have not found the nerve yet. We finally find the nerve and we get a response with our our nerve conduction at 0.4 milliamps. So 0.4 milliamps, remember the lower the number, the closer we are. So we're right on the nerve at 0.4 milliamps. Then as we get closer to nerve, the nerve starts getting irritated. And you'll see that this is EMG activity from all facial nerve muscles. So we immediately inform Dr. Ellis, we tell him that we're having sustained, you know, high frequency EMG activity. This is indicative of impending injury to the nerve. Um, we let him know. 
we next immediately run a motor evoke potential because when we see something like this, we like that we do multimodal, so we like to correlate it to all different tests that we're doing, not just base it on one test. So we go to the next test, which is the motor evoke potential. And you notice the purple, they're not there anymore, or they're significantly degraded. That's an injured nerve that you're seeing electrically right there. So you see the blue, that's our baseline. All that stuff happened where we have that EMG activity, now I run the motor, and the motor significantly degraded. But our job is not to just predict injury, it's to prevent injury. So the next thing that we did was we stimulated, you know, Dr. Ellis grabbed the stimulator and we stimulated the nerve again, where we initially were getting it at 0.4 milliamps. Now in the same exact spot, we had to go up in intensity to get, it the same, to get a response. So we went from 0.4 to 0.7. So we had a loss of our motor vote potential. We had spontaneous EMG activity occurring. And now we have an increase of intensity in the same area that it was stable before. This is all indicative of an injury, of an impending injury. So at this point, Dr. Ellis decided um, he's going to abort the rest of the procedure. He probably got about 85% of the tumor. So he was happy with that, but he couldn't go on with this procedure any longer because if he went on, um, this could have turned out to be a permanent deficit. So by aborting the procedure, giving it time to heal, he averted a devastating injury. The patient uh, woke up with a very slight facial palsy, which subsequently healed in a few days. So that's the exact reason why somebody like me uh, is in the operating room with the neurosurgeons is to help predict and prevent, um, you know, catastrophic neurological deficits. And some of the cool stuff that we're doing, because we're we're not just uh, clinicians, but we are also scientists, and we we like to propel our field forward. Um, and this is only being performed at Lenox Hill Hospital right now. Some patients that have brain tumors need to have their surgeries done awake because it's in their speech area of the brain. And when they're awake during these procedures, we can talk to them and we can stimulate their brain while they're awake. And we can put them into what we call aphasias where, where they have speech disturbances based on stimulation. And when we do that, the surgeon can marginalize the area of the brain that's speech and stay away from it in order to avoid a speech deficit. Well, unfortunately, not all patients can tolerate a, um, an awake surgery. So we developed a technique where we do a sleep, uh, we do motor speech mapping while the patient's asleep. And we do that by targeting certain muscles that are specific to motor speech. It doesn't work for receptive speech because that's a sensory thing. And, and I don't really want to get into the whole uh, neuroscience behind the speech. It's a very, very complex um, system, but we have very, we've had very good outcomes with the motor speech. And I'm going to show you how we do this. It's very, very interesting. Um, so what we do is, so here are my needle electrodes. This muscle is known as the cricothyroid muscle. It's a muscle for phonation. It helps you uh, with your speech. It's one of your uh, pharyngeal muscles. Um, so we put needles there. We have needles in the facial muscle here. We have needles, you can't see them. This brown lead is, is in the tongue. And then this is the endotracheal tube. This is the tube that, that the patient's intubated with. And you can see these blue and red wires. These blue and red wires, this endotracheal tube has electrodes embedded on the tube that sit on your vocal cords. And the idea is that when we stimulate the brain, if we can activate any of these muscles, it's been shown that these muscles um, electrophysiologically are markers for motor speech, meaning that there's a good chance that that's motor speech area if we can find these muscles interoperatively. So this is the way your brain is kind of um, is made up, where uh, out laterally, so out, if you think about it like this, out by above your ear, is going to be your face and tongue area and your larynx. And then as you go more towards the top of your head, then you get your hand and your arms and your legs. Your legs are going to be the most in the center of your head. Now, Obviously, this looks nothing like this. We don't know where these where these areas live, nor does it even look like this for that matter. So what we're trying to do here is we find the motor cortex and the inferior frontal gyrus or the pars articularis. This is the part. So this part of the brain right here is are the markers for speech. If we can stimulate the areas here, we can get responses from that cricothyroid and from the vocal cords. And we can say, okay, we need to avoid this area. 
So I'm going to show you us doing that here. This is uh, Dr. Bookvar uh, doing a case. Um, I want to say a few weeks ago we were doing this case together, and uh, so what? This is a stimulating probe. This is the brain. Now, as you can see, it doesn't look like this, nor does it look like this. So by stimulating the brain. I'm seeing that electrical activity on my screen. I'm telling him, okay, that's the hand, that's the face, that's the vocal cords. We're having that communication. So, so that's hand there. Then up here is going to be vocal cords. So, and basically we do, this is called brain mapping. And we basically do this in all different areas. And the idea is that we're trying to find an area that doesn't give us a response. We don't want the motor response because the motor response tells us that's where motor function is. If we cut into there, the patient's gonna wake up with an injury. So if we can find the area that's electrically silent, that's not giving us any, um, any motor responses, then we're, then we're fairly safe. And this is what it looks like on our screen. So this is what I'm looking at. So when we stimulate the hand area, we get this response here from the hand. So here's the hand, here's that response from the hand. So this is the hand motor area. Then when we move the stimulator and we get the vocal cord, we get a little bit of a vocal cord here and then we get this response later, remember this is time. So when you look at, these are about 10 millisecond divisions. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 milliseconds about 55 milliseconds, we get this late response. Oops, we get this late response. And the late response correlates to the inferior frontal gyrus where the early response, which you're seeing here, correlates to the motor cortex. So this tells us we're right on the border of the motor cortex. And we're also getting a little bit of a hand response. So we're kind of stimulating here and getting kind of this whole area here. Then we find just the pars apicularis, which is that late response. You can see it here, and this is the cricothyroid. thyroid. And these are the vocal cords, and you can see it here. These are those late responses. You don't see anything in the early responses. So this is telling us, okay, we're at the inferior frontal gyrus. Next, we find the electrically silent area. Nothing, you don't see anything on the screen other than our stim artifact. There's nothing on the screen. I tell Dr. Bufar, this is electrically silent. This is where he decides he's going to cut into the brain and take that tumor out, and the, this patient woke up with no speech deficits. Um, this was a similar type of case I did with Dr. Ellis. And a lot of times what surgeons will do is, they'll, what we'll do is we'll find the area of motor or speech and they'll put a marker down. This green, um, this green marker here identifies that this area is a no-go zone for the surgeon. He does not want to cut into here because this is where motor or speech is. And he uses neuro navigation. This is navigation system. See the tumor here. Right where we found speech is right where he wants to go into the brain to get to access to the tumor, but it's not safe. So he had to adjust his um, his game plan based on what we found. That's why we're in the operating room to help identify neural structures, to help predict and prevent, um, you know, neurological deficits. Uh, it's 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 a pretty important role, and um, you know we have a we have a a, a place to play in the. Um, or a piece to play uh, in, in complex neurosurgical procedures and spinal procedures. I wanna thank everybody and thank you Brain Terms and Ashley for putting this together and, and Dr. D'Amico uh, for inviting me to speak. And um, I guess we have time for questions or I don't know what time it is. Yeah, we do have, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, you throughout your entire talk, we're getting just so many, like I'm so grateful for this. Thank you for showing us this aspect of medicine, like I think a lot of people don't get to hear much about what neurophysiologists do. And it's really, really cool. Um, so it sounds like people loved it. It's, we're getting spammed with thank yous. Um, <laughs> and like, I cannot express, express how grateful I am. Um, okay, so let's see. Oh, can you talk a little bit about um, the path to becoming a neurophysiologist, like what the schooling is like, et cetera? So, so currently it's a multidisciplinary um, discipline. Um, like I think I said earlier, there are a lot of people from all different backgrounds. There, there are neurologists that do this. There are PhDs like, like myself who does this. Um, there are people that have bachelor's degrees. It's a great, it's a great field to get into. Um, the currently in, at a, at a back at a bachelor level, um, there are two programs that currently offer um, bachelor degrees in this. The University of Michigan, 
offers a bachelor degree in interoperative monitoring through their kinesiology program. And I believe Carlo University, um, in conjunction with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, offers a bachelor's degree in uh, interoperative monitoring as well. Um, and then there's a, a master's program uh, out of University of Connecticut. Um, University of Connecticut offers a master's in surgical neurophysiology. And then a lot of us learned, like I have neuroscience degrees, so we learned a very, very small aspect of it in my neuroscience, you know, world. And then we turn clinical, you know, we become providers and uh, we learn. So there's all different ways to get it. And that's in the US, uh, in, in different parts of the, of the world, um, there are, um, so I believe this is, there's people all over the world on this, on this, uh, on this call, right? So um, I know in, in England, there's a pathway to go through um, to become a, a neurophysiologist and depending on what level of education you get is how you can supervise, for example, like if you have a bachelor's degree, you can be a provider, but if you're a doctorate level, you can be a supervisor. It's that kind of a situation. Um, you know, so it all depends on, on what part of the world you're in, but in the United States, um, there's all different ways to get in. We have, we have chiropractors that get involved. We have biomedical engineers that become neurophysiologists. We have, uh, you know, like I said, neuroscience people. We have um, EEG uh, techs that transition into the operating room. So it's, 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 it's just getting your kind of foot in the door, so to speak. That's great. That's really cool. And, and, and yeah. what's nice that, that a lot of people don't know who we are. We are in the background, you know. I, you know, I always tell patients, you don't want to remember me. I'm the person you don't want to remember because if you don't remember me, <laughs> you had a great, you know, surgery, and that's that's all that matters. And um, so we are in the background, and we don't have a lot of, you know, it's not we're not widely known, you know, what is who we are. And I think it's I think this is this is a great opportunity to kind of introduce this to a, a lot of people about other pathways other than being a nurse practitioner or a physician or a physician assistant, for example, that you can really be part of somebody's life and have a really fulfilling job and and mean something to somebody um, without necessarily, I mean, I went through nine years of college, but you don't necessarily have to do that route, to, you know, go there or go through a neurosurgery residency for that matter, you know, if, if you're not up to that task, that's a whole different, a whole different ballgame. Yeah, that's really, really true. Um, I think everyone's loving how passionate you are about this field, um, your field, and it's great to see. Um, it's like contagious, which is awesome. Um, but this is a question that's more of a technical one. Um, someone asked, Austin asked, do nerves stimulate with the same amount of amps no matter the location? Like, do nerves in the arm take a little more to move compared to that's, that's a nerves great elsewhere? Question. That's a great question. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, a nerve, there, there's a couple ways to answer that, right? So if you're talking about stimulating a nerve directly, so meaning you've exposed the nerve and you're stimulating, they're going to have about the same amount of um, of intensity you need if you, you're actually on the nerve itself. But if you're stimulating through your skin, trying to acquire a response from a nerve, that might that's going to need more stimulation than being directly on the nerve. And your upper extremity might need uh, less stimulation than your lower extremity, for example. Um, and all depends also. There, there's so many confounding factors that that I didn't get into in this, and and you know how anesthesia affects what we do. Because remember, the 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 goal of anesthesia is to make sure the patient doesn't remember anything, make sure they don't feel anything, make sure they don't um, <clears throat> they don't move. So what's that? They inhibit the entire nervous system. And what's my job is to excite the nervous system. So the um, every patient's gonna be their own control, so to speak. So what somebody needs to elicit a motor response, for example, I might be able to get it at 100 volts uh, on one patient and have the exact same anesthetic regimen on the next patient and need 500 volts. So every, it's, everybody's a kind of their own control in that sense. But when you're directly down on a nerve, it should be about the same um, when the nerve is actually open. How do you figure out like what someone's kind of baseline control is if it's like specific to the person? Like when are you figuring that out? So when they when they come when the patient rolls into the operating room, there's a lot of stuff that goes in to um, into the setup in a in a surgery. And you know if you guys think back to Dr. Ellis's lecture and he was showing, you know, walking through the operating room. And that was a case that we're not involved with because of the nervous, nervous is not, not really at risk for what he's doing there. Um, 
but if we were involved when you walk when he walked into the operating room you'd see us you'd see the nurses you'd see and after the patient goes to sleep we place all these electrodes for all the different target areas that we're looking to target and then once we get everything established we run a baseline on that patient before they even make skin incision we know what that nervous system is telling us prior to surgical incision that way if we have to troubleshoot or anything's happening we can fix it right then and there you know and not a, and not everybody has you know they come in these are patients that are having surgery for neurological deficits sometimes they don't have responses at all and we just document that we you know we have a patient comes in and we just can't get a response from that patient because they're neurologically compromised and we, we try to get something so um all different things we do try to get a baseline prior to skin incision and then we kind of and then we watch throughout the procedure we also, you know, as a neurophysiologist, we do have to understand the surgical steps, you know, and it's, 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 we have to, we, it's funny, we, we have to know anesthesia, we have to know surgery, we have to know what we do, because we have to understand when the structures are at risk, because there are certain points in the surgery where things are more at risk than others. So for example, you know, he's opening the, you know, he's cutting the, the bone for the, um, for the uh, bone plate not such a high risk point of procedure for us, but he's taking out the tumor near the white matter tracks, very high risk part of the procedure for us. So uh, there are different things that we have to understand and, and know when to look at things and, and certain tests are more important than others at certain points in time. Because again, we're running multiple tests throughout the case. So you like really have to know what's going on in the surgery, which is Yes, <laughs> you have to, you have to know Yes, you have to know all the steps of the procedure and all the risks and how different anesthetics affect you. Um, there are neuromuscular blocking agents that knock out your motor system. We have to understand that. Um, we have to understand how inhalational agents affect synapses in the brain because that's going to affect our, our waveforms. And because we do adjust throughout the case, we'll adjust. You can't be hard and say the patient can't be awake during these procedures. So you have to be able to work with the anesthesiologist. And the way we do that is it's always whatever's safest for the patient. And then we'll adjust off of that. And um, we'll also notice that there'll be trends in a case that are caused by anesthesia. So we'll see waveforms. Like we kind of talked about, we're looking at time and size. Well, anesthesia affects time and size of these waveforms, but we, we know what we're looking for in that sense. So if things start shifting and it's not correlating to something the surgeon's doing, then we start looking at the anesthetics and we start talking to the anesthesiologist. Not everything is surgically induced, and but we have to be aware of all that stuff. That's a lot to keep balancing throughout the procedure. It's like very head on a swivel. Um, yeah, and we're, and we're there the entire time. We don't leave. Most of us are not. Um, uh, there are there are people that are employed by the by the hospital systems that are kind of shift workers. Since, but I'm a, I'm in a private group and we are not shift workers. I'm there, just like you know Dr. Ellis said, from the time the surgery starts to the time it ends, we're we're there throughout. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more, Dr. Silverstein, about why you chose this route? Like, why did you choose to become a neurophysiologist? And That's a, why others I might took a want very to? circuitous route to get here. Um, I, my undergrad is actually in music and sound engineering. And I was a musician for many years, professional musician for many years. And I decided that I wanted to do something um, in healthcare. And at the time, um, my, uh, my girlfriend at the time was not my wife. She was an occupational therapist. And I said, oh, that would be interesting and look, you know, fulfilling. And I wanted something because, you know, my music career wasn't really going anywhere at the time. And I started to go do some, um, some coursework to, because I had my engineering, but I need some of the life science stuff for, uh, for a, you know, for a, um, for a clinical career. And I started taking some coursework and I ended up working in a neurology office that introduced me to all these neurodiagnostic tests. And I kind of just fell into it and I went back to school and I got my, my graduate degrees in, in neurosciences. And, and I, just, I just fell in love with, with neuroscience and, and being an engineer by trade um, made jumping into this very easy for me because I understand the ones and zeros, for example, right? The engineering component of what I do in the operating room because there is an engineering component, right? Amplifiers, stimulators, you know, recordings, you know, there is an engineering component to it. Um, so that made, you know, so it was just learning the, the neuroscience and the surgical side and the, and the, so, and I fell in love with it and I've been doing it for the past 15 years. 
that's so interesting. What a like cool journey you had to get here. Um, and I see why you love it. It's really, really fascinating. Um, people are asking, um, so someone asked, uh, would you recommend being a neurophysiologist to someone who likes a lot of doctor patient interactions? Like, so are you able to interact with patients or is that something you don't get to do as much and you wish you had more of? We, uh, we do interact with patients. Um, you know, not in the sense of the same way a surgeon would or, or a PA or a uh, nurse practitioner, for example. We don't follow patients postoperatively in the sense that we're not, I don't see a patient in the office. I see the patient, you know, right before surgery and I talk to them uh, when they're in the holding area, um, the operating room, and I introduce who we are and what we do. And we explain, you know, to the best that we can what, what we're going to do procedure. But once that procedure is over, you know, um, that's pretty much it. I do follow up with all my patients, with my surgeons, see how they're doing, make sure everything is stable. Um, but as far as seeing the patient afterwards, you know, or, or far in advance, we don't, we don't track them that way. So if you're really looking for that, 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 that patient, uh, provider relationship, then it might not be, uh, for you. Cause like I said, we see them, you know, about 15 minutes before we get into the operating room and then they're asleep. Which some people like. I, I enjoy that. I, I enjoy my patients to sleep um, and, you know, doing my thing. Um, but I, I did work in, in clinics. I have worked with awake patients. You can get in and be like a nerve conduction technologist or an EEG tech. And that's kind of on the um, uh, a different end of clinical neurophysiology. And you can do that and, and have more patient contact. So if you're looking to get in, involved with something like that, um, you know, you can be an EEG tech and you would be doing outpatient or even inpatient EEGs, for example. Um, and you'd be dealing with, you know, awake patients and, and, and things like that. So there are different avenues you can go in this field. Very cool. Um, this person uh, has asked this twice, so I want to make sure we get to it, even though we're almost out of time. Um, Nick was asking, is this technology used in a rehabilitative setting? So maybe like rehabilitation with nerve stimulation and stuff like that? Do you There's know? A, there is a whole component of functional neurosurgery that we are involved with. Um, I personally don't do it, but yes, there's deep brain stimulation. There's spinal cord stimulators that are, um, I actually, I'm involved with some spinal cord stimulator stuff, but there is a whole side of it, yes, that that we are involved with, that we can be involved with, depending you know, depending on on, um, on your access uh, to it and, and your ability to learn it. There's some really cool work coming out of the Cleveland um, Clinic where they're doing nerve transpositions and then implanting, um, basically electrodes and patients that have prosthesis and they're implanting electrodes into the pectoral, uh, pectoral muscles and by basically um flexing your chest you're able to control your hands with a prosthesis so that's really cool work in our field coming out of the cleveland clinic but that's you know they're still doing the trials on that but i have a, a good friend that um introduced me to that and uh and uh is is doing that and is very it's very cool so it's very, there are very cool things that you can do in the re rehab side of things yes and functional function we call functional neurosurgery functional neurosurgery okay very cool um so it looks like we have reached our 12 o'clock time um but dr silverstein that was amazing i think people really really loved this it was something different and unique um, and I think people really appreciate getting to see that. And you spoke to people all over the world and like you, I really, really appreciate getting to hear you talk. That was so awesome. Thank well, you for thank, joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody. Feel, if anybody has any questions, feel free to contact my contacts on the screen. Feel free to contact me anytime. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. We are done for today, everybody. Um, so we will be back tomorrow. Um, and we're losing people quick. Um, so I feel like I will just post in the Facebook group um, about the lectures tomorrow. But thank you everybody for coming today. I hope you enjoyed it. And yes, yeah, see you tomorrow. Bye.